Okay, good afternoon. <laughs> I'm Hilary Landorf, Director of the Office of Global Learning Initiatives, which is the office that oversees the Peace Corps prep program at FIU. I'm honored to be here and to welcome you all, Provost Furton, Peace Corps Director Carrie hessler Radelet, FIU administrators, faculty, students, alumni, FIU and Peace Corps staff, community members, returned Peace Corps volunteers, welcome to the official launch of the Peace Corps prep program at FIU. <laughs> I'd like to recognize the creators of today's program, the Office of Global Learning Initiatives, the School of International and Public Affairs, the Department of Communication Arts, External Relations, the Office of the Provost, and the Peace Corps. We all know how it takes a village to put together a, an event like this, and I want to thank you all for your enthusiasm, your positive spirit, and your work in contributing to the success of this launch. Today's program includes some of the best of FIU. And please make sure to stay until the end as we have a very special announcement that involves winning an all expense paid trip to Washington DC this spring. To begin, I would like us to situate ourselves in terms of where we came from, where we are and where we're going. For in many ways, the collaboration that we're officially marking today represents the orienting needle of our FIU compass. Or in 21st century parlance, the current picture of FIU on our GPS device. For those of you who entered FIU today by our main entrance, you walked by the Charles E. Perry Primera Casa building, named for the first president of FIU, and literally our first academic building. On the side of the steps of this building is a plaque engraved with our three founding goals. One, education of our students. Two, service to our community. And three, greater international understanding. Our first president was a true visionary, passionate and determined to help realize a unique institution of public higher education in South Florida. It was his personal mission to ensure that all students who graduated from FIU would be prepared to respond and contribute to the needs of the community and take action in solving the world's most pressing problems. When FIU first opened its doors to students in 1972, President Perry gave a speech to the Board of Regents in which he said that every FIU job applicant was to be asked to commit their hearts, their heads, and their hands to a truly participatory educational process, to treat every student with equal respect, and to embrace the community and the world as sites for learning. Throughout our almost 50 years of existence, our, our FIU has been consistent in designing and successfully implementing programs that meet its three founding goals. We now have over 54,000 students pursuing one of our over 180 degree programs and collaborating with their professors on research ranging from developing groundbreaking treatment for kids with ADHD to serving family health needs in communities throughout Miami-Dade County to mitigating the damage of the next hurricane, to searching for one of the lost tribes of Israel in Papua New Guinea. And now, under the auspices of global learning, we have Peace Corps prep at FIU. The perfect embodiment of our founding goals, our present and our future. FIU is proud to be a collaborator in preparing students for such a dynamic, and vibrant arm of government service whose mission mirrors our own. To be clear, although people of all ages serve in the Peace Corps, it is often a young person's first on the ground experience in international relations, international service, 
and international diplomacy. <clears throat> and we have made a promise to every student uh, that by the time you graduate, you will be empowered with the knowledge and skills you need to become global citizens. In fact, you will now have the opportunity to meet three such students, exemplary global citizens in their action and their aspirations, Gareth Pearson, Kay Ann Linton, and Meji Pierre-Louis, will now each regale us with their own global experiences while at FIU. Hello, my name is Gareth Pearson, and as a representative of my alma mater today, I welcome you. I was born in cosmopolitan Miami to very well-traveled polyglots, so a love of foreign cultures has been drilled into me ever since I was a small child. When I learned that I'd won a Boron scholarship to study Portuguese in Mozambique, along with the history, the politics, and the culture of the country, I was overjoyed, to say the least. So I went, and I studied, and I immersed myself in the culture, and for six out of the 10 months that I was there, I even managed to intern with the Elizabeth Glazier Pediatric AIDS Foundation. But that's what I was expecting to do. What I wasn't expecting was a chance to see the developing world as it really was. This was a life-changing experience for me, which I would have never gotten to undergo unless I'd studied abroad. It's not really something you can learn about. You have to see it. You have to experience it. And I saw great poverty and suffering, yes, just the way that CNN shows it to us. And I also saw much more than that, though. I saw raw beauty and such great potential that I never dreamed existed. In Mozambique, right after independence, there was one university in the very south of the country. Now they're popping up everywhere. The healthcare system that I worked with while I was an intern there was far from perfect, but it strove to be omnipresent and accessible to as many of the citizens of the country as possible in most reasonably populated areas. In the US, if I were to have a conversation with one of my coworkers or one of my friends, uh, I don't know, I'd say something like, oh yes, did you see her dress yesterday? Oh, have you seen this music video? <laughs> In Mozambique, I could talk to anyone on the street about domestic politics, external affairs, technology, or business. The people of Mozambique yearn for growth and development, and they strive to achieve that goal. While I was in country, I stayed with a host family, which were very dear to me. They were very dear indeed. I arrived a total stranger, and they made me an uncle. They made me a brother. They made me a son. And in particular, I became the adopted uncle to a gaggle of small children. There were five. It got messy. Um, but they were, they were brilliant. They were beautiful. They were very bright, very precocious. They spoke English, Spanish, a little French, Portuguese, of course. Um, they loved history. They loved science. They were always curious. They were every bit as capable, intelligent, and just enthusiastic as our American students in our American education system. The only thing they liked in Mozambique were opportunities. I decided to go on my barn experience as training for my future career as a foreign service officer in the State Department. However, before I went, I wanted to pursue that career path to project American interests abroad. Now I still want to do this, but only while simultaneously working to improve the lives of the citizens of the countries where I would be stationed. We in the developing world have such great resources ready to be invested, and the, de I'm sorry, the developed world, and the developing world has such incredible, incredible talent ready to be cultivated. It would be my honor and my pleasure as a foreign service officer in doing my best to bring them both together. Thank you. Hello. 
My name is Kay Ann Linton, and this is a story about how studying Chinese changed my life. In 2009, I graduated from Cornell University with a degree in English and a dream of becoming a novelist. And then I became a bum. <laughs> I spent two years confused, aimless, and jobless until I decided teaching English was my only option. I enrolled in FIU's undergraduate education program, and on a whim, I also enrolled in a Chinese class. Best decision of my life. At first, it was just a fun challenge, but then one day, my teacher said, Kayanne, if I didn't know better, I'd think you were a native speaker. In the next two years, I won two Chinese speaking competitions and tons of praise from Chinese strangers who said I sounded like I came from the mainland. I was flabbergasted and ecstatic. I'd finally found my niche. Best decision number two, study abroad. This was another whim. Some classmates were talking about going to China and I said, count me in. Living in China transformed me. Communicating with people in a foreign language was like having a superpower. My confidence exploded. One day it just clicked. I am going to teach Chinese. That was two summers ago. This past summer, I was in China again on a US Department of State critical language scholarship. And now that I'm back in the US, I tutor other students of Chinese. And I plan on getting a master's in teaching Chinese so that I can help spread the language around the US. And ultimately, Chinese will help me achieve my original dream because I plan on writing novels in Chinese <laughs> geared to language learners. It's funny how everything comes together when you're on the right track. Now, thanks to Chinese, I can have my dream and a career too. <laughs> 谢谢大家 Hello, my name is Meji Pierre Louis, and I want to welcome you all here today. So, there I was this past summer, 18 years old, on a mission to conduct groundbreaking research in Haiti through a McNair Research Grant. I spent my time there working with 10 incredible high school and middle school students, trying to develop within them 21st century skills. I saw that originally I had set out to prove Cisco and UNESCO research on educational systems in the developing world to be totally false and implausible. They claimed that the developing world was not preparing students for 21st century skills, which included critical thinking, leadership, and technological dexterity. So I arrived at the Haitian Ministry of Education, picked up the official curriculum books, and read their beautifully written commitment to developing within their students 21st century skills. But when I got to the classroom, I saw that real world teaching methodology was not preparing students for 21st century skills. So, in fact, Cisco and UNESCO were right. Still, I pressed on. I wanted to know why public schools were not providing the quality of education they claimed to want for their students. And I realized that there was no way these schools in such an impoverished nation could provide education in a way parallel to the Western models of delivery. So my research ended up being about trying to find a way to integrate 21st century competencies into Haitian standards. By the end, I found I was able to teach my 10 students these skills within four weeks. They created a video documentary proposing solutions for country-specific issues they wanted to see resolved. So where was the transformative paradigm-shifting moment within my research? It was in realizing that maybe through mutual cultural exchange, we can learn together how to create culturally relevant quality education. As someone aspiring to consult international governments on how to create quality educational curricula and policies, I know that my time spent in Haiti will allow me to be an asset to every government I consult. And thanks to FIU's support, I know that what I learned will allow me to have an influence on generations to come. Thank you. That was fabulous. <laughs> Thank you, Gareth, Kayanne, and Meji. 
I'm sure that global problem solving and success will be integral words in your future careers. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Provost Kenneth G. Furton. There are many paths to global problem solving, and Provost Furton is an exemplar of one of them. Most people who become global problem solvers start by considering a worldwide problem and figuring out how to solve it. Another way is to focus on a problem that is in your neighborhood, solve it, and then apply your findings and solutions globally. This is the path that our provost has taken. When Provost Furton came to FIU in 1988, he became interested in working with dogs that are used for investigations of arson. His initial plan was to develop an artificial nose that could do what dogs do with their incredible sense of smell. But very quickly, Provost Furton realized that the dog's nose is so sophisticated that there was no way an artificial substitute could be developed. So he continued his lab research to study the odors that dogs were responding to, not just from arson, but from drugs, explosives, money, and cadavers. This research was his international ticket. Our provost is now a world-renowned forensic scientist in this field and has served as an expert witness in dozens of high-profile international, federal, and state trials involving the use of dogs as scent de detectors. He also has over 700 authored publications and invited talks, both here and abroad, has garnered over $300 million in research awards during his tenure as the Dean of the Co College of Arts and Sciences, is the founder and director emeritus of the International Forensic Research Institute, and most recently has been invited to speak at the Royal Society of Chemistry in London on the paradigm shift for forensic science in the United Kingdom. It is my honor to call to the stage the Provost of FIU, Kenneth G. Furton. Thank you, Hillary. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I want to uh, especially welcome the members of the Peace Corps that are here and people who have been in the Peace Corps. Um, it's with great excitement that we're going to announce the launch of FIU's Peace Corps prep program, which I was just uh, uh, notified this morning or late last night that we are now up to 72 students enrolled, which I understand is one of the largest programs already in the country. That's <clears throat> that's fantastic. And um, as you'll hear, this program offers uh, enhanced academic and, and of course service-based courses to prepare our FIU students to enter into the Peace Corps and for other positions in international development. <clears throat> I, I especially want to thank our Office of Global Learning Initiatives Director Hillary Landorf, who you just heard from, who herself is a Peace Corps volunteer who returned uh, and has dedicated uh, much of her effort in recent years into developing our, our global learning initiative at the university. The, I'm, I'm certain that this innovative program and partnership is gonna foster a much deeper collaboration than we already have with between FIU and the Peace Corps. And it, it's interesting that our history with the Peace Corps actually dates back to the very beginning when we first welcomed students here to FIU in 1972. Uh, and during that year, Jack Hood Vaughn <clears throat> who was the second national director of the Peace Corps, was appointed as FIU's first dean of international affairs. And as dean, he actually strengthened and broadened our international programs, research, and relationships. And as you heard from <clears throat> Hillary, that that was it's in our founding mission. And to date, we have had 187 FIU alumni have served in the Peace Corps. 
and we currently have 11 that are, are currently serving. So we really do feel that this program is a natural extension of the beginning of the foundation of this university and our longstanding relationship with the Peace Corps. But it also, of course, fits perfectly with the Global Learning for Global Citizenship Initiative, which itself was designed to prepare every FIU student to fulfill their civic responsibility in our diverse and, and ever interconnected world. Here at FIU, our students are committed to finding sustainable and uh, sustainable solutions to the world's most critical issues. And we really are honored to be able to offer this new Peace Corps prep program uh, to our students. FIU's uh, local and global endeavors, such as our uh, Globe Med and Alternative Breaks, wouldn't be possible without the great efforts and influence of all of our faculty and staff who've taken on the role of mentors and leaders. So too, the success of our partnership with the Peace Corps depends on the dedication and guidance of its supporters and leaders. So I wanna thank all of you who've participated in, in developing these programs for all of your hard work, and I wanna thank all of you that are here who've developed these programs over the years. <clears throat> And on behalf of FIU and the School of International and Public Affairs, we are here delighted to host Director Kerry hessler Radelet as the Ruth K. and Shepard Broad Distinguished Lecturer this afternoon. We are so grateful to the Shepard Broad Foundation, as well as the Broad and Bustle families for their continued support of this lecture series. And of course, their support of the School of International and Public Affairs here at FIU. And their generosity is, is what has allowed us to have such distinguished speakers such as Director hessler Radelet, uh, to come to our campus to help foster international dialogue amongst our students, our faculty, and the greater FIU community. And I also wanna, of course, recognize the School of International Public Affairs and the Executive Director, uh, uh, John Stack, as well as the uh, Dean Mike Heithouse, who's here, which houses the School of International Public Affairs for their, uh, the, hunt, the $1,000 contribution towards the special program that you'll hear the announcement uh, about at the end of this program. And so without further ado, I wanna bring up the, our uh, uh, next speaker. And we are indeed fortunate to have Carrie hessler Radelet here, the director of the Peace Corps. Uh, she was appointed just this past June after serving as deputy director for over four years. She is also a returned Peace Corps volunteer. She has more than 20 years experience in public health, focusing on HIV, AIDS, and maternal and child health. And as director, she's committed to improving the success and efficiency of the organization and has been instrumental in initiating the new Office of Global Health and HIV in the Global Health Service Partnership. Her dedication to the Peace Corps and to global concerns is really an inspiration to us all. So please join me in welcoming Director Carrie hessler Radelet. today. Excellent. I am so happy to see so many people. When I saw the party that was going on out there, I was sure there would be nobody in this auditorium. Imagine my relief. <laughs> um, I want to start, because this is how it is in the program, with recognizing someone who's very special to the Peace Corps, and that is Dr. Krish Jayachandran, the professor of Earth and the Environment. So I'd like him to come on up. Let's give him a hand. 
For the past 15 years, um, Peace Corps has had a master's international program here at FIU, and that would not have been possible without the incredible support and dedication of what Dr. J, as we call him, because we, his name is a little bit tough to say. How did I do on it, though? Good. Uh, did I, was I okay? Okay. Um, FIU's Master's International Program equips students with the education, skills, and experience to pursue careers in environmental policy, natural resource science and management, sustainable development, and I think a number of other courses. So uh, it's been a very important program to us. Environment is one of our six major sectors. Of course, climate change and environmental degradation are concerns around the globe. And um, we've had such an amazing partnership with Dr. J and with FIU, and we are very grateful for that. So I have a certificate here. This one I can say suitable for framing. <laughs> it says, Peace Corps presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Chris Jayachandran with respect and gratitude for your invaluable contributions to the Peace Corps throughout your 15 years of service as the coordinator of the Florida International University Master's International Program in the School of Environment, Arts, and Society. You've achieved a record of dedication that reflects the highest ideals of the Peace Corps. Congratulations. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. Um, this is just not my effort alone. Uh, I have my predecessors, um, Dr. Joel Heinen and uh, Dr. Mahadev Bhatt. And uh, it was uh, initiated by um, Dr. Joel Heinen when he was the um, graduate program director and then uh, passed on to Dr. Mahadev Bhatt and then I took over. And um, it, it's a great program and uh, our students are really great. Uh, they are doing a lot of environmental uh, research projects. And along with agriculture also, that's uh, something, uh, uh, organic agriculture and all those things, they're amazing things they're working on. We hope uh, to continue our partnership and do more, much more. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Well, let me just say how delighted I am to be here on the special occasion of launching the Peace Corps prep program. Now we currently have just about 25 universities across the country that have the Peace Corps prep. It's a new program for us. And to know that you have 72 students already is quite amazing. How exciting. I, wanna, I know that some of them are here. Can I ask you to stand if you're a Peace Corps prep? Well done. <laughs> Well, that's wonderful. It's just a fraction of the 72. So thank you for being here, and thanks for taking on this new challenge. Um, I also know that there are some Return Peace Corps volunteers in the crowd. So can I ask the Return Peace Corps volunteers to stand so we can recognize your service? Wow, that's great. So I was last here at FIU in February and met with your faculty, Dr. J, and a number of other people, Hillary, and um, I promised that I would be back with Peace Corps Prep, so I'm really delighted to have been able to make good on that promise. It's really a, a thrill. FIU is a perfect university partner for us. I mean, any university that has international in its name is a good university for the Peace Corps. <laughs> But not only that, you have high quality academics, you've got a real commitment to service, you have a global approach. Um, you're a perfect university for us, and so I am really just so thrilled to be here. Um, I wanna, again, I wanna recognize just a few people who, um, who have been particularly helpful to us as we have um, gotten this program off the ground. I wanna thank Eric Feldman, who's the coordinator of the FIU Office of Global Learning Initiatives. <laughs> for his leadership and passionate support. Stand up. There he is. And then you've already met Dr. Hillary Landorf, who serves as the coordinator of Peace Corps, uh, Peace Corps prep program here at FIU. So we're very grateful to Hillary. So, and you heard that she started her international career as a Peace Corps volunteer in northern Morocco, so. 
So let's see. I just want to thank all of you for the important step in starting the Peace Corps prep, especially those of you who are doing this for the very first time. It's hard to be the first ones. So you have demonstrated courage, and we're very grateful to you. And I hope that in a few years I'll be out visiting Peace Corps countries, which I do often, and I'll be meeting all of you. And if I do, please remind me that I was here and you were here, okay? Um, Florida International University, as I said earlier, is one of nearly 25 universities that have the Peace Corps Prec program. The program helps students gain skills and experience for careers in international development, whether they do that through the Peace Corps or through any other number of different programs. We heard from some of your students that they, have, um, that they may have different careers in, the, in public service or in the foreign service. Peace Corps prep is good for any service that is focused on international development. The Peace Corps provides partner universities like FIU with core learning objectives, including foreign language studies and community service, and then each university creates its own program of academic study and extracurricular activity. So the prep programs will actually vary from country or from uh, university to university depending on your own skills and interests. So each one is unique and that's very special. Students will have the opportunity to build on their international experiences through Peace Corps prep coursework and projects. Graduates of Peace Corps prep will receive a certificate from the Peace Corps and a competitive edge when it comes to applying for Peace Corps service, as well as uh, acquiring the skills and experience that they need to make them competitive applicants for other positions, other jobs in international development. So it's really just a great program for anyone who's interested in international development. Peace Corps prep graduates at FIU will also receive the FIU Excellence in Global Learning Medallion, which launches this fall as well in recognition of students' enhanced global awareness, perspectives, and engagement. And I'm really excited about that. I don't think there's another Peace Corps prep university that has a twin medallion. So well done, FIU. Um, I'm really confident that the Peace Corps prep program here is going to open up new and exciting uh, doors for those of you who participate, and then I think the rest of the campus as well, as you really take on a commitment to international development and global engagement in a, in a new way with a new partner, us. So we're very, very excited about that. Now, you know, because I was just talking with, uh, about Dr. J, that the Peace Corps Prep is not our only partnership here. We're delighted that since 1998, we've offered the Peace Corps Master's International Program. As you heard, this is an opportunity for students to um, begin academic work and then serve for two years in Peace Corps and then come back and complete their coursework. And it's a fantastic way to really get a applied experience as part of your master's program. Um, some of the programs, um, and I'm not actually sure here, but some of them uh, also offer scholarship programs as well. For students like Elena Nybor, the, P the MI program was a wonderful pathway to, learning, to earning an advanced degree while gaining unique, real-world work experience. After completing her coursework here at FIU towards her master's degree in environmental studies, Elena is currently serving as a natural resource management volunteer in Mexico helping an underserved community expand their use of rainwater harvesting, water filtration, and other strategies for sustainable water management. When she returns home, she's going to complete her final two semesters of coursework at FIU, and then she hopes to continue her work in water management and climate through uh, climate change mitigation, and she has a real special heart for rural communities, so she'll be coming back and looking forward to that. Uh, we interviewed at Elena, and she says that she hopes to continue her learning and professional growth um, through her international work as well. So Elena is just one good example of how the MI program can really help to launch your career. With 187 uh, FIU graduates having served around the world in the Peace Corps. So throughout our history, 187 FIU graduates have served in the Peace Corps, and we currently have 11 alumni in the field today. This university is really a great university for us. We're really proud to have a dedicated partner like FIU here in the Miami area, which is not only a top-tier research institution, and I've been learning a lot about all the excellent research that takes place here, but it's also the largest Hispanic-serving institution in this country, which is remarkable. In 2014, FIU ranked eighth in the country among the top Peace Corps university producing Hispanic students. But I'm told that Fernando Figueredo, who is the Director of Career Services, why don't you stand, Fernando? 
He has made it his mission to get you to the very top of that list. So we're going to watch that. And if you're, if you're successful, Fernando, I will be back here again. I'm sure I'll be back here anyway, but anyway. So we're really eager to see FIU climb to the top of all of our rankings. And as we work to realize our vision of a Peace Corps that represents the very best of the United States and reflects the rich diversity of our nation, I can't think of a better place than FIU. We are very committed to making sure that Peace Corps represents the beautiful multicultural nation that we are. We think it's one of the most important messages that we send when we send volunteers overseas because we are really truly a microcosm of this world. And when we send volunteers out there to communities, what we're communicating is the rich diversity of our nation. And you can help us do that. So we really want to be a partner with you in that way. Every day, Peace Corps volunteers are changing lives all around the world. And so I want to use my time today to focus on just one of the many ways or the many areas where volunteers are making an incredible impact. And that is by protecting the environment, by addressing climate change, and by working in global development. As we speak, Peace Corps volunteers are using GPS technology to help cashew farmers in Ghana measure crop production and calculate the amount of pesticides that they need, or fertilizers they need, safe pesticides, I might say, uh, planting thousands of red mangrove seedlings to help reforestation efforts in Senegal, working with communities in Albania to create green spaces, helping communities in Peru implement recycling projects while creating new sources of income, bringing clean, safe drinking water to communities and schools in Zambia, and helping communities implement strategies for sustainable development of coastal areas in the Philippines. About 17% of our Peace Corps volunteers focus specifically on the environment and agriculture projects, although many, many more of our volunteers imp um, incorporate environment and agriculture into their work as either secondary projects or just you know in their education programs. At the request of our host countries, modern day volunteers lead grassroots efforts to protect and preserve the environment in some of the world's most vulnerable areas, communities that are susceptible to risks of climate change as well as other environmental threats, such as water scarcity, destruction of coral reefs, pollution, and natural disaster. Volunteers strengthen communities' understanding of environmental issues and empower partners to develop their own programs to protect and preserve the local environment. Peace Corps volunteers don't just go the difference. They stay. They are present, living and working in their communities for two years. After all, and you heard this from Gareth. Gareth, I thought you said this so beautifully. You can't begin to appreciate the complexity of a rainforest, unless a, a rainforest ecosystem, unless you actually stand beneath the beautiful boughs of those branches. You can't truly understand the vulnerability of our reefs until you immerse yourself in a coastal ecosystem. You can't fully comprehend the consequences of urban pollution on rivers and streams until you sink your boots into the contaminated creek beds and smell the fumes wafting from toxic runoff. You can't really begin to understand the challenge of protecting our most vital natural resources and helping people in some of our poorest communities sustain life until you step into their shoes and see the world through their eyes. I think about what a volunteer named Brittany Duffy wrote about an eye-opening experience that she had as a Peace Corps volunteer. Brittany received her undergraduate degree from FIU and is now serving in Nicaragua as a food security and sustainable agriculture volunteer while completing credits towards her master's degree in environmental science at FIU through its MI program. In her coursework, Brittany said, she would study the efficacy of reforestation prom promotional practices and wonder to herself, why wouldn't they just plant more trees? It wasn't until she arrived in Nicaragua and immersed herself in her community, a community that she describes as having 650 people and 40 million chickens. <laughs> That's a little frightening to think about. <laughs> 
that she began to really understand the challenges of reforestation and sustainable agricultural development from the point of view of the people actually tilling the soil and working the land. Peace Corps volunteers bear witness to poverty, to hunger, and malnutrition in the developing world as few outside those communities ever get to see, experience, or understand. And as we heard from Gareth, they also have the opportunity to view incredible beauty, incredible promise, incredible opportunities. By their presence in their communities, Peace Corps volunteers demonstrate that the people of the United States stand with them against poverty, against discrimination, against environmental degradation. Volunteers personally experience the devastating effects of climate change, whether it's the loss of crops due to drought or flooding, or rising seawaters that threatened coastal communities. And because they become trusted members of their community, they are uniquely positioned to help their communities undertake the challenges that come with sustainable development whether in a coastal Filipino community where reef protection is at odds with farming or fishing practices, or in a village in the Dominican Republic where the needs of local pig farmers directly clash with the community's desire to manage fresh water and freshwater systems. So development is complicated. You sometimes have competing agendas, both of which are really important. You have the needs of environmentalists, and then you have the needs for development and economic growth, and families just earning enough money to be able to feed their children or pay any school fees that they might have. At a time when the demands on our growing population are outpacing the capacity of additional resources, when biodiversity is being threatened by human activity, and where the climate is changing faster than our efforts to address it, it might seem as though the goals of the environmental movement and the goals of the development community are at odds with one another. You might think that. Protecting the earth on one hand and growing economics on the other. Preservation on one side, development on the other. It might seem as though we might have to choose between fighting poverty and restoring the earth, but this is a false dichotomy, and it has presented, it has, and it is what has preempted a widespread recognition of a term that you all know and that I've already used, sustainable development, or development that needs the that meets the needs of people in the present time without compromising their ability to feed or house or clothe future generations, allowing future generations to meet their needs. So it's development that lasts in the hands of those for whom it is intended. And what the multifaceted work of Peace Corps volunteers has shown is that we cannot fight poverty over the long run with also, without also protecting our most vital natural resources. We cannot mitigate the risks of climate change without also addressing the economic needs of those communities most vulnerable to its consequences. So we need to do both. In the end, protecting our planet and helping communities lift themselves out of poverty are responsibilities that belong to all of us, from the world's largest, most privileged nations to its smallest and most vulnerable. From a Peace Corps volunteer who travels halfway around the world to make a difference to our local counterparts who are ready to step up as the next generation of change makers in their communities. In the words of anthropologist and public health pioneer and good friend, Dr. Paul Farmer, the environmental movement has for too long been a movement of the privileged. In our time, in the face of global challenges before us now, as Dr. Farmer says, we cannot build an environmental movement or a movement for sustainable development that does not also have the social and economic rights of the poor at the very center of the movement. Today, many environmental sciences, scientists, economists, policymakers, and NGO leaders understand the challenges and opportunities of, of environmental protection and global development far better than we have, than we did several generations ago or even in the past decade. 
But one significant challenge that remains is ensuring that successful interventions and proven solutions reach our most vulnerable communities. And that's where Peace Corps comes in, because our volunteers are working to do exactly that. They specialize in working at the last mile, where traditional development programs have difficulty reaching and where they most frequently break down. By living and working side by side with those they serve, they experience firsthand the cultural norms that influence daily behaviors and attitudes towards resource management. In the words of Stephanie Chilcote, an agricultural volunteer in Tanzania, volunteers are uniquely positioned to understand the issues and tailor solutions to the individuals and villages that they work with. They work in hand in hand with those, their, their community. In Indonesia, which I just visited last week, I came back on Monday actually, uh, a Peace Corps volunteer not only helped his uh, community install hand washing stations in a local school, but also worked to institutionalize those practices by working with government leaders to ensure that local um, the taps and, and local water systems were available throughout the community and then worked with them to teach the community about the importance of clean water and hand washing. Because they had a real problem with kids being sick and missing too much school. And so that's where we came in. Our volunteers were teachers, but they identified that there was such a high rate of, of absence that the, and they identified that it was really actually diarrheal disease that was keeping students away. So that's why he decided to take up this project as a secondary project. And it was in an Islamic school. It was really a, a wonderful collaboration between the government and this um, madrasa and a Peace Corps volunteer. In Cameroon, a Peace Corps volunteer is planting 2,000 trees at a local school not only to revitalize the land, but also to provide shade to students who often spend hours and hours outside under the sun. In China, Peace Corps volunteers are organizing camps to teach students in the world's most populous nation about the environment, about pollution control, about local ecology, and sustainable agriculture. And all the while, volunteers are not just making a difference in faraway communities. They are also investing in their own futures and in ours as a country. And that's why we're so excited to announce that Peace Corps received a record-breaking number of applications in 2014. You might have just seen the news last, just a couple of days ago. <laughs> the highest number of applications in 20 years. And I have to tell you, we were really only 15, 15 applications away from being a 35-year high. Wow. But we're, we're very honest about our data, so we didn't claim that. <laughs> we had a 70% increase in applications over the last year. And most of that was in the last three months when we have our new application process. It now only takes one hour to apply to the Peace Corps. That's a big thing. <laughs> Most people used to regard the application process as being your first test. <laughs> Today, Peace Corps is a training ground unlike any other and a launching pad for a 21st century career. And that's particularly important now. I mean, we live in a very complex, interconnected world. It doesn't matter what you do, what your future job is, it's going to have global implications. And that's why FIU is so important, and that's why the Peace Corps is so important. When I left for service in Peace Corps, you heard that I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Western Samoa. I served there with my husband. I don't think you mentioned, Provost, um, that I'm a four-generation Peace Corps family. Four generations and six members of my family have served in the Peace Corps. My grandparents served when they were of retirement age. That's how we got the first generation in. But yes, so I, I, we, it, it more or less is in my DNA. But I have to say that I honestly, people ask me all the time, you know, did you ever think that you'd be director? Well, of course not. <laughs> I mean, there, I, I, I never dreamed that I would ever have the role that I have. I used to aspire to be a country director, which I think would be really a wonderful job, frankly. And, and it is maybe the most important job we have in Peace Corps. But I'm pretty sure the next director wouldn't want me to be a country director. <laughs> But what I want to say is that you really don't have to travel thousands of miles from home in order to make a difference. You don't have to join the Peace Corps to make a difference. I, I hope you will. I hope you will. I hope that in a few years when you're ready to graduate from FIU, or perhaps a few years after that, 
if you're not ready at graduation, if you're you know, thinking about what you want to do in the future and you're ready for an adventure, but you're ready to make a difference, I hope you'll consider the Peace Corps. Not just for the sake of the communities where the need is great, not just for the sake of our planet's future, which depends very much on your generation rising to the challenge as well as ours, as well as ours, but the future is in your hands. But I hope you'll consider choosing Peace Corps because it will challenge you, it will teach you, it will open your eyes in ways that are impossible to predict. It will open doors of opportunity that might be impossible to imagine now. It will inspire you to believe even in the face of some of the steepest challenges that you will ever encounter. In the profound, it will help you to believe in the profound power of people's resilience, compassion, and hope. And I just want to say in this right now, you know, I, I've done a lot of work in Liberia, and my, and my work is in public health. I, I spent six years helping Liberia build its public health system, and I'm devastated by what is happening there right now. One summer, I took my son there, and he was 16, and he spent the summer playing, um, working with a small organization called Right to Play, which is an organization that uses sports to teach um, team building and life skills and things like that. And they're a partner in some countries with the Peace Corps. Um, but he went and worked in West Point, which if you read the news recently, you may know that West Point is the largest slum area in... Um, in Monrovia, the capital, and was the area where there were some extensive riots after the Ebola crisis. It's a very densely populated area and really, really poor. It's right on the edge of a river, and when the sea rises, it comes into the houses. So they're living in about this much water. And he came home, and he, what he said was this. He said, Mom, I have never seen so much poverty. But what I have learned at being in West Point is that the people are amazing, that they are optimistic, they are full of life and full of love. And the most important thing I learned is that we, the things that, that bring us together as people are so much greater than the things that divide us. And you don't have to have money to be happy. He said, I saw happiness there in those huts because there are people who are full of love for their family and they're full of love for their community, and they are working hard to make their community a better place. I thought that was pretty amazing for a 16-year-old kid. <laughs> but that is what you discover as a Peace Corps volunteer. You, you might think that what you're doing is confronting poverty, but what you're really doing is confronting human possibility and hope and optimism. You will meet some of the finest human beings that you will ever know on the face of this earth. They may not be literate. They may never have traveled beyond 15 miles of their home. But they are people of in incredible courage and incredible joy and have so much to offer us. And, and what I would say, and I, you know, you, there are a lot of return Peace Corps volunteers in this room, and you can ask them yourself. But nearly every single one of us would say that we got more than we gave because the love and the support and the encouragement of our communities was so much greater than what we were able to impart. And that is the mystery of Peace Corps. Because our, and while, while we're able to demonstrate impact, and we do have impact, and I hear stories every single day, really. I mean, I don't take a cab across Washington, D.C., where I don't meet a cab driver who says, I knew a Peace Corps volunteer who helped me to learn English. And because of that, I qualified for university. And now my daughter is a doctor here in this country happens to me every day. But I think what maybe the most profound impact on Peace Corps is what it does for us. It shows us the world is a very small place, that we really have so much to share with each other and with the world, that what unites us is so much greater than what divides us. It's a special privilege to be here in this university that is committed to making this world a better place, that is dedicated to forging international bonds that last, that is absolutely committed to building peace in this world, which is perhaps the most important thing any of us can do. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak tonight. And Steve, do you want to come up? I, I think we're going to do some questions and answers. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. This is Steve Hunsaker, who's head of our South Florida office.
I also want to sti say Steve, did I already say this? Steve won Recruiter of the Year for Peace Corps. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, we asked a few people, or we gave everyone the opportunity to submit a few questions in advance with the promise that they would get to ask the questions first. So we're going to have two people who hopefully are in the room stand up and ask their questions. Then we'll open it up for a couple more questions uh, after that from anyone. So the first one is a student here at FIU, um, but he is Simmons Lane. Yes, okay. Um, hi, uh, how do you make sure Peace Corps volunteers have the environmental knowledge necessary to help communities make sustainable choices? That is an excellent question. I'm so glad you asked that. And I would say the answer is right here at FIU. We have the Peace Corps prep program to help people learn a lot about development, sustainable development, language, culture. We have the Master's International Program that provides a lot of technical knowledge around environment. And then every Peace Corps volunteer goes into a training program that lasts for about three months where you learn language, culture, and technical skills to enable you to be successful. You know, of that though, I have to say that probably the most important thing you can learn is the language and the culture because that's what enables you to do your job. And in the beginning, what our volunteers do is they go and they do this participatory action for community assessment. It's a, it's a community assessment process that you do in collaboration with your communities. So it ensures that what you're doing is really what the community wants. And um, through that process, volunteers are able to understand the situation, not only in their country, not only understand sort of the technical work of environmental protection and what have you, but really begin to understand the implications for their community there. And every community is different, and the needs are different. So I would say, that, frankly, the most important thing is being able to communicate and being able to listen and to build bonds, frankly. Thank you. Thank, great question. Uh, the next one. That's an excellent question. Let me just start by saying that Peace Corps is in any given country at the invitation of the nation, of the president, really. They write me a letter and say, we want to have a Peace Corps program in our country. And we agree with the government on the technical area of the program. And we have six sectors. Let me just tell you what they are. So they're environment and agriculture, education and health, youth development, and community economic development. So we agree on a program that the government has said is a priority. So, but your question is how, does, how do you make sure that this is what the community wants? So we send volunteers who are trained in a general area. As I mentioned, the first thing that they do is this PACA, this community assessment. But the other thing that we really encourage them to do um, and also, I should say that our training is community-based, so our volunteers move immediately into the community for their training in small groups. So all aspects of their preparation are community-oriented. But we really encourage our volunteers when they get there to spend the first three months, four months, five months, just getting to know their community, spending time talking to local leaders, identifying who are the change makers in their community of any age. You know, you may have the mayor or you may have the traditional chief, but you may have young people who are particularly um, effective at, at um, rallying their peers. And we work a lot with young people. About 78% of our volunteers, of our beneficiaries are in fact young people under the age of 30. So we really teach them to identify who are the local um, indigenous leaders, get to know them, get to understand the concerns of the community, help, you know, ask them what are the obstacles to development and what are your solutions. And um, then from there, they take what they come with, their technical skills, and they craft a program that helps meet the needs of the community. 
Now, if we have time at the end, I will give you a, a very good example of that. But I don't. It, it's a story that takes about ten minutes, and I want to make sure that I. <laughs> we'll see how many questions I have, and if I have time, I'll tell you a really great story that demonstrates that. That that has. Anyway, maybe I should just tell the story. Should I just tell the story? All right, I'll just tell the story. Sorry, sorry, Steve. Sit down. <laughs> so this is a story of uh, Ian Hennessy. Ian was a community health volunteer in southeastern Senegal, and I met Ian. And he was placed in a village called Kedegu, which is in the southeastern part. It's the area of, of Senegal that has the highest malaria incidence rates. And malaria every year in his community killed a few children. So he, when he got there, he was introduced to a young man named Sheikh, who was head of the community health team. There were five, it was a village of about 500 people, and there were five community health workers. And it was their, their job to, you know, teach hand washing, but also malaria prevention was a big um, part of their program. So they started working with the President's Malaria Initiative, which is a U.S. government initiative, to give bed nets to, to not only to every household, but to every sleeping space. And so they did this very careful census of every sleeping space, and they passed out bed nets and felt very happy about that and were sure that that was going to result in lower malaria incidence rates. That was best practice. Um, so Sheikh was his best friend. Sheikh lived in the house right next door to him, and he would spend almost every evening with Sheikh and his family. And in particular, he loved to play with Sheikh's four-year-old niece, whose name was Jenaba. Jenaba was really the apple of their eye. After Ian had been there for about six months, one day Jenaba came down with a fever. Three days later, she died of cerebral malaria. No one could believe that the child, that the nephew, I'm sorry, the niece of the head of the community health team who slept under a bed net had died of malaria. How did that happen? Well, they actually knew how it, why it happened, and this is kind of what I'm talking about. The community knew that there is a latent reservoir of malaria that exists asymptomatically, so people don't demonstrate symptoms. But because they got malaria when they were young, they become resistant themselves, but they carried the parasite in their blood, and it was possible, of course, to then infect others. And that's what happened. Someone with asymptomatic malaria in their community um, was bitten by a mosquito who then bit Jenaba, and Jenaba died. So she slept under a bed net, but she wasn't under the bed net the whole day, and sometimes mosquitoes bite at dawn and dusk. So Sheikh and Ian put their heads together, and they said, what can we do about, asymptic, uh, what, about this latent malaria problem? And they came up with this idea. They said, why can't we go to every household where someone has malaria test them for malaria, and if they have malaria, test everyone around them to see if there are other people who are asymptomatic but who carry the parasite. That had never been done before. And so they went to the National Malaria Control Program. Ian, what Ian brought was connections, right? As a Peace Corps volunteer, he could talk to his country director. They got a meeting at the head of the, with the head of the National Malaria Control Program, who really liked this idea of what we now call proactive case detection and treatment. Uh, we then went to the CDC. He went to the CDC with Shake. Um, to see if they would be willing to do the monitoring and evaluation necessary to determine whether or not this was an effective intervention. And so the National Malaria Control Program thought, this is interesting, let's just try this one village. We'll try it for one rainy season. And CDC said, okay, we'll do a case control study. We'll find another village that has the same malaria incidence rate and the same bed net coverage rate and see if your intervention which is pretty intensive, of going house to house and testing people is going to make a difference. It was the idea of the local health team. It was not Ian's idea. What Ian brought was the supplies, because th they went to the National Malaria Control Program. OK, so they did this. Every week, they went to every house in the community. They tested anyone who had symptoms of malaria. If they found someone in the house who had malaria, they checked everybody else. They were able to identify a whole lot of people who had malaria who were asymptomatic. They treated everyone with drugs through the regular supply chain. So no, no one came with extra supplies. It was all through the regular chain. After one 
rainy season, the difference between the case and the control village was 90% decrease in malaria incidence. So then you say, okay, well, this is a very intensive intervention. Can this work in a larger intervention area? So then, with the help of Sheikh and his community health workers, they went out to, a, to five surrounding villages. And those health workers trained other health workers. Again, the CDC did another, you know, same thing, control study over here, same process. After one season, same result, 90% decrease in malaria incidence. So they just, this last rainy season, now Ian is gone. Ian is now actually at Emory University. Um, yeah, <laughs> he's a fellow, a Peace Corps fellow at Emory University and is uh, working part-time at CDC in the malaria control program because they love him. <laughs> um, but anyway, now some other Peace Corps volunteers. Now we just completed this last year, this last rainy season, just completed a pilot with 145 villages. Again, the training all done by Sheikh and his team of village health workers, along with those that had participated in the you know, smaller five village um, pilot. Now more than 1,000 community health workers, all Senegalese, 17 Peace Corps volunteers involved. The result of a district-wide event, 85% degree, 85 decrease in malaria incidence. It's an amazing result. And they are actually talking about the possibility of, of this one state in southeastern Senegal being malaria free. Now they're going to have to keep doing it because of course malaria comes across the border and what have you. But it becomes possible to talk about the end of malaria. Now this again I want to make sure that it's clear. This was, the, this was the innovation that came between conversations between a Peace Corps volunteer and a community health team. Everything they did was funded through the government, through regular channels. But it is that engagement between volunteers and the staff and the permission to think big or think differently or think outside the box and to connect communities with resources that they otherwise wouldn't have access to, that is the difference. And, and I would say, I mean, this is all part of the training. We train volunteers to make sure that all activities are community-led. Because if they're not, they're not sustainable. The volunteer leaves, and, and I can tell you some stories about that, too. <laughs> all right, so I think what we'll do is, oh, this no. event is really about Peace Corps uh, prep. I want to see if any of our Peace Corps prep Oh, don't be shy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, let's wait for the microphone, please. Uh, yeah, the mic's coming to you. I said it's more of a personal question. Are you willing to answer? Um, answer? Sure, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my question is, in one word, describe the most important moral lesson that you've learned. Wow. That is a good question. What's your name, first of all? <laughs> What's Ke your name? Keel. Keel, right. okay. Most no. important moral lesson. Oh, my gosh. One word. Dun, 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 ah, yeah, exactly. Dun, dun. You know, the only thing that comes to mind, I don't know if this is the most important moral Answer lesson. Answer from the heart. Empathize. So it comes to my. That's what comes to my heart. I don't. Is perfect. That, I don't know. What do you think about that? Empathize. Is that a good thing? Empathy. <laughs> okay. Great. That that may be the tuss, toughest question anyone ever asked me. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. Key, keys, Keels. Keel. Thank you, Keel. Great question. I'm gonna have to think about that. I'm gonna come visit you when you're a Peace Corps volunteer, and then I'm gonna ask you that question. So start thinking about it. <laughs> All right, we do one more question. Um, anyone have a question that they would like to ask? Yeah. That's all right, anyone. Um, I was just wondering if you can say a little bit about how um, when you return from volunteering, if you're not in the master's program or something, how you would, how this would help you integrate into kind of a, a career when you come back. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent question. Thank you. Um, I really believe, and I started to talk about this at the end of my speech, you know, our world is incredibly interconnected. It, it's very obvious. All you have to do is look at the front page of any newspaper to know that what happens on the other side of the world has implications right here at home. And so I really believe that our future, and, and in fact right now our employers are looking for people who are globally competent, people who can speak other language, who other, understand and appreciate, and especially I would say appreciate other cultures, that can talk to people who have different perspectives, different ideas, can listen to them, can empathize with them, and can find commonality, that can um, manage multicultural teams, that can um, bridge cultural divides in a work environment. Those are the kinds of people that our employers are looking for. Um, and I think that that's one of the, you know, one of the important skills that Peace Corps gives you because you do that on a daily basis, basically. <laughs> You're living that every day, global competence. You know, a lot of companies, Fortune 500 companies, come to Peace Corps and say, will you train our executives? Because they know that the skills that Peace Corps volunteers um, develop over the course of their two years of service are the skills that they need to be successful in business, especially in emerging markets, which of course is the fastest, I don't know if you know this, but eight of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa right now. So the, the world um, is very interconnected, and even if you go the private sector route, there's huge recognition of the importance of being able to work effectively in other cultures. So that would be my answer. Mm -hmm. I just have to say as a follow-on to that, that it's really employers and students who prompted us to apply for a Peace Corps prep program because it's the, employ the employers in Miami and our students in Miami who want this. So thank you, Director hessler Radelet, for such a stimulating talk and thanks to all of you for such engaging questions. It's time now to let you in on our exciting announcement. Uh, to celebrate the launch of our Peace Corps prep program, we're having a competition open to all undergraduates at FIU. This contest asks you to think deeply about your own international or intercultural experiences. What's more, it challenges you to inspire others by sharing your experience via artistic or informational media. A panel of five global learning experts will select two winners who will each receive an all expense paid trip to Washington DC this spring to meet with key people at the Peace Corps headquarters and in other government agencies. Details are on our website goglobal.fiu.edu as well as at the resource tables in the back of the room. Uh, so please um, compete <laughs> in this contest. <laughs> in closing, I have two announcements. First, for the Peace Corps prep students, I'd like to invite these students to the stage in, a, in just a minute, as the Peace Corps director has graciously agreed to have her photo taken with you. And then finally, I want to thank everyone for your participation today and to urge all of you to become involved in your community, for it is global and all of us are all potential global problem solvers. So thank you. Thank you.